welcome back. Thank you. We got five whole minutes off. Um, this committee is not health and welfare. This committee is finance. And we are, at this point, think we may have some COVID relief money that can be used for broadband for telemedicine. And so, but it's got to be up and running by the end of December. So we're looking for, in your experience, is there a cluster? Is there a particular area? Is there a lack um, of connection? Anything that we could hopefully put together a very compress project or maybe four or five small projects that could be up and running by the end of the year. Um, if, if our consultants who will be in hopefully by the end of the week, first of next week with their um, recommendations for the use of broadband and CFR money. So I'm gonna start with Helen Laban and I don't, yeah, Helen, uh, just introduce yourself. I feel like it's old home day because this is my morning, but um, the rest of the committee isn't on health and welfare. So just tell them who you are and the floor is yours. Great, thank you. And, and thank you for giving us the chance to talk about uh, this subject in this committee. Uh, so I'm Helen Laban. I'm the Vermont Public Policy Director for Bi-State Primary Care Association. I also, 10 years ago, ran the eVermont Community Broadband Program with ERA funding to do broadband deployment and close the digital divide in rural communities. So it really feels like old home day to me because this is what I was talking about 10 years ago. Um, so uh, some things have changed, some things stay the same, and, and I have been uh, nominated to be the one who talks about that very specific overlap of telemedicine broadband infrastructure and CRF funding as it affects um, healthcare systems in Vermont. So I'll give that and then turn over to the other folks to talk a little bit more about how telemedicine is working. Um, and, and just in a short answer to your the questions you have posed, there's good news and there's bad news. The, the bad news is that for telemedicine during COVID-19, we are really talking about reaching every residential address in Vermont. And as we know from past broadband work, uh, that means that there are places popping up all over the state in every town that don't have adequate infrastructure. So that's the bad news there. The good news is that there are many very clever people in Vermont who can get access out to those locations. So we do think it's possible uh, to do with this funding and we can make that difference. Um, just quickly on the telemedicine, this was something that we were moving towards slowly in Vermont prior to COVID-19 and it became something that we um, embraced very, very quickly overnight uh, across all different provider types all over the state. I know for my federally qualified health centers, they went to 90% remote visits overnight from virtually none. Um, that's eased back some now, but it, it hasn't eased back entirely and, and nor will it ever as part of COVID-19 response. And you know, that, that's because the direction is still to minimize unnecessary in-person visits. Um, we're still redoing our physical spaces to have social distancing, so that limits the uh, number of patients we can see at any given time in person. Patient acceptance has changed. I mean, how many of us are going to agree to sit in a crowded waiting room during flu season ever again after this? Patients just won't. Um, so we know we have to deliver telehealth. And of course, we're always preparing in case there's another spike, another wave where we have to shut down to more strict stay-at-home orders um, and, and more severely restrict those patient visits. Um, so that means that we do need to be able to get telemedicine out to all residential addresses. And often now those residential addresses also have clinicians who are working from home um, reaching their patients. And I should say, I, in these remarks, I'm speaking specifically about residential. Obviously, facilities, larger facilities, will have greater broadband needs, but I'm looking at the deployment to, to households and to residences right now. Um, Helen, who, yeah. who is this by, by state primary care represent? We represent the federally qualified health centers, uh, PPN and uh, Planned Parenthood of Northern New England, Free Clinics, and AHEC. Although I am speaking here on behalf of the provider coalition that submitted a letter. So I'm speaking more broadly. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. Though I, I, I would love to go down the rabbit hole of FQHCs at any time, but now I'm speaking more broadly than that. All right. Yeah. Um, so then obviously we have been delivering these remote cares even without broadband to every residence. And we have a couple of workarounds available within the health system for that. We have audio only codes that are being reimbursed. Um, we also have folks connecting to hotspots, but obviously in medical care, there's often times that you need to see things, you need that <laughs> visual component. Yeah. And um, often doing those visual exams in a public hotspot for reasons you can imagine is not going to be- uh, I would though. see that as highly undesirable. <laughs> exactly. So while we do have some bridging options here, what we really need is, is broadband at the home that, that folks can get that, that connection. Um, and so when we look at what, what counts as people being able to access telemedicine from home, uh, telemedicine, telehealth can encompass a wide range of things, but um, there are national standards around this. So when we look at the speed and the capacity we need, what we're looking at is the speed to have a stable audiovisual um, conference using a platform like Zoom, which was actually a, that's a pre-COVID-19 thing. That's a standard um, platform to use for these visits. And for the clinician to be able to run their record keeping platform at the same time so they can take notes um, and fill out the medical record. So we know, you know, what we use to see what's adequate capacity. Uh, it gets a little murky when you look at the national standards. So the um, FCC does have a standard for what counts as adequate telemedicine capacity. That's 4-1. Um, we reject that as being way <laughs> much too slow. That's not, a, that's not a popular FCC position right now. Um, there's another group called TTAC, the Telehealth Technology Assessment Center, which is the nationally funded group to assess technology. Their estimate, I would say, also airs on the slow side at 8-2 for being adequate for that basic telemedicine access. 8-2. Yeah, we would say that, especially during COVID-19, when you have demands on the household use of broadband, 25-3 would be the minimum threshold we'd be looking at um, to build out to residential areas. and. And we think that that would in fact be adequate. And again, when I say we, I'm speaking for the provider group. We did poll everyone on the adequacy of 25-3. Um, I, now I'm, I'm, I understand that that's a controversial speed in Vermont that does have a economic development goal of 100 symmetrical. Uh, so I, I recognize that. Um, but in terms of the very specific question of what we need to get to residences to access telemedicine adequately during COVID-19, uh, we would say 25-3 is the answer for that. And frankly, we, we needed it yesterday, right? So we right. would put a high emphasis on technology neutral, get the job done, um, get us the access that we need to reach our patients. Okay. Um, and then I would just say in addition to this, something that I know you know, but I, I, I do want to note that it's not just a question of the broadband infrastructure, right? People need to be able to afford that connection. They need the equipment to connect and they need the basic digital literacy to make those connections. So of course, um, it is a necessary but not sufficient answer to have this broadband deployed to all these households. So, you know, as we discuss it among uh, providers, we also talk about those other elements of what constitutes true access to broadband and to telemedicine. Um, and that's the, the short summary of, of telemedicine and broadband infrastructure and, and what we need, we need 25-3 to every residence um, now, instantly, if you, if you could do that. <clears throat> but we do feel that this is crucial in the COVID-19 response. Okay. Um, committee, any questions for Helen at this point? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Todd Young. Uh, there you are. Unmute yeah. myself. Can you guys hear me? Yes. I, well. I, did, um, I did submit some um, slides, but I don't have permissions to to present them. Um, but but you I, now have permission. What's that? You now have permission. Okay. Let me just go. Faith is all powerful. There you go. Um, so um, let me just bring up. Uh, 
So um, <clears throat> thank you for, for the invite to uh, discuss this topic. I'm Todd Young. I'm the network director for telehealth services for uh, Uni <laughs> University Health Network. Um, what I thought I'd do is just give you a brief update of, of telehealth um, status at UVM Health Network and then uh, some, some of the assessments that we've done with both providers and patients uh, with our rollout to kind of really feed into some of the testimony that Ellen, uh, Helen just shared. Um, okay. You know, our response to telehealth was uh, very much like what Helen just said. Um, <clears throat> we, we went from a, a small program <clears throat> at all our facilities um, uh, before uh, COVID, but um, what we ended up doing in, in March, April, uh, May is is we have deployed at <clears throat> deployed at every department over a hundred departments, um, mo mostly in our inventory clinics, but with some patient workflows as well. Um, and just about every specialty and every provider type um, you can imagine, anywhere from primary care all the way to to um, ophthalmology. Um, and we've gone from having about 150 telehealth platform users to about 3,000 platform. Uh, users with both providers and staff in that time frame. Uh, this just a quick peek at, at looking what our volumes um, were uh, in the beginning of March all the way up to uh, to the end of May and you can see that we're north <clears throat> most uh, north of a thousand uh, every day but then some days you know we're north of 2,000 visits in, in one day with telehealth and we were averaging we were averaging about 60 a week uh, prior to COVID. Um, so pretty dramatic there. Um, so the good news is we are reaching a lot of a uh, lot of patients, but the bad news is we're not reaching all our patients, and that's why we're here today. And one of the things that that we've done post our our, our rapid rollout, as we called it internally, is we've we've been working hard around of this assessment of what, what is the user experience of telehealth um, <clears throat> from both our patients and our providers perspective? And, um, and this is some direct feedback <laughs> that we've gotten and patients are, you know, having, you know, patients that don't have uh, connections within or, or network within their homes are driving to locations around the community to, to, get, um, to get care. And this may be driving to a Lowe's this may be driving to one of our facilities that, that is broad, uh, broadcasting uh, guest networks. And um, this is even prevalent in Chittenden County, uh, Milton, Essex, other places. Uh, we literally have supervisors in some of our offices directing patients to go um, to places where they uh, know that we have network. Um, but this is a bigger case in central Vermont and you know some of our other um, line areas. Now, is this going to a hot spot or is this? Yeah, they're literally driving to to places where they know that, that there are guest networks and doing the uh, the visits within their cars with their portal uh, portable devices, which is, you know, very creative, but, you know, not the best Awkward. Uh, best circumstance, um, especially, you know, when you think about pediatrics or something where, uh, you know, a patient is, uh, a, a family member is trying to um, connect a patient, uh, a, a child or what have you. Yeah. Um, the, you know, we have frequent um, situations with unstable networks. So people not meeting that 25-3 um, threshold that Helen was describing. And, you know, that affects the quality of care. Um, and then many patients are not, you know, the, the we get a lot of uh, feedback from the patients that they're not able to afford broadband or mo uh, mobile data plans to, to get care. On the provider side, a lot of feedback um, focusing around, you know, the time, the technical assistance um, to deal with these types of issues with, with patients. And it really interferes with their time to be focused on care. Um, and then the, the really bad side effect is if, if we get into a unstable situation with a, with a, a patient, um, providers will quickly transition to phone. 
um, whenever they have a technical issue. And, you know, again, that's a quality of care issue for, for those patients. And, um, you know, a lot of our providers and their staff um, have had to practice remotely and broadband doesn't just affect our patients and access to that. It really affects our providers um, and where they live. And they may even have, they have the means um, to pay for broadband, but they may not have the ability to have it in their homes um, due to, you know, the situation we have in Vermont. And then a lot of comments from, uh, from providers with the frustration um, that, um, that patients um, of, uh, you know, low income Vermonters not having the ability to get, uh, to get network. And therefore we have, you know, really a, um, a, a social economic in inequality issue for, for our patients. So, you know, those are, you know, those are the challenges that have been uh, faced up to us and, you know, to your, um, uh, uh, Chairman um, Cummings, to your, your question, you know, what, what, what kind of things can we do by the end of the year? Um, I agree with Helen getting as much broadband or connectivity up to the homes, but um, there are other strategies that also can, um, can be thought of and, and that would be to sponsor some, some projects around getting network into community places um, where, or, or <clears throat> um, where we could have some private visits that may not be a medical facility. It, it could be at town, town municipal offices, it could be at libraries, it could be you know, places where we could put infrastructure out there um, for private places. Um, to get care uh, out <clears throat> when 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 network isn't available, so that we don't have patients driving all around towns uh, to to find network, um, that might be okay. one way to spend some money. Right. Um, so that's um, that's my testimony. All right. Thank you. Questions. Committee. All right. No, now I can no, see you. No, thank you. Uh, Senator Pearson has a question. There you go. Hi, Hi. thanks. I, I'm just curious if um, for you or others, do, do you bill a, a telehealth console just as if you walked into the office or maybe you're not the right one to ask that, Todd, but I'm curious about that. No, we, we do. Um, <clears throat> Thank God for, for some changes in policy uh, in the front end of the COVID crisis that um, a lot of the, the billing inequities were, were adjusted um, for fee-for-service type um, uh, services. So we are billing at par um, right now um, through, uh, through some of the changes that were made um, by, by CMS and our private payers. And, and Senator Cummings will know that I, I could talk for the next two hours on that particular question. It does depend on by provider type. Um, Vermont has parity payment for things that are equivalent to an in-person service. So it's the equivalent of an in-person service and it's the same payment. There are other telehealth codes again to other things that, that aren't the equivalent, but that's not really what we're talking about here. We're talking about equivalent services. All I can say is that this has been the subject of uh, intense discussion in health and welfare. We, we made a lot of concessions in the emergency bill that we did the last day that really moved this forward during the emergency. But the question is when, you know, how long will it be after the emergency before people and um, telehealth seems to be less iffy than telephone only and should those um, calls still be you know paid and at what level should they be paid um, right. so Jen is here but we well I'm glad you're still wrestling. under intense discussion my kid had a, a consult with her ear doctor by telephone so <laughs> yeah our phones aren't that special. You can't look down their ear. It's hard to argue that it's equivalent, but it seemed to be billed like an office visit. Like, 
So I was just curious. So that's basically the practice, but but you guys in health and welfare are chewing on that. Looking at it. And earaches was always something I would have just loved to have been able to call in, especially when you get them once a month. Best Buy does offer a home otoscope that you can use connected to your phone to look in your child's ear. Just if you're in the market for it, go and put that out there. There you go. It's getting the penicillin at midnight. I always had great sympathy for people going to the emergency room with an earache in a kid because they cry a lot at midnight. Okay. Um, so any questions for Todd Young? If not, we're going on to Devin. Yeah, oh, Devin is here. Hello. Devin Green, Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. Um, I don't need to add too much more to what Helen and Todd said. We fully support it. Our hospitals have been utilizing telehealth a whole lot more, as well as the telephone only. Um, and I would say that we are pursuing the telephone only because of the broadband issue. So we want to ensure that folks continue to get care in all of this. We realize that there is a disparity um, for people who are uh, more rural or who are low income. And so we want to ensure that they still get their care, but a better, more high quality care can be given to folks if everyone had um, affordable broadband. So we definitely support Ellen's proposal of affordable broadband for everyone. And in terms of looking for places where it's needed, um, you know, we can try to give you more specific information, but certainly the Northeast Kingdom, certainly areas of Southern Vermont, Central Vermont, as Todd mentioned. Um, and we're happy to follow, follow up on more specifics, but I would just say that all providers, whether it's a one shop therapist, a one person therapist uh, calling from their home um, to our hospitals are really in need of uh, better broadband to get that high quality telehealth out to folks. Um, and I think the other thing that's important to know is that there are a whole lot of healthcare workers who want to get out of cities right now and move into Vermont. And we have um, a workforce issue and we could use those healthcare workers, but their partners need broadband and um, that would be helpful as well in the workforce arena. Okay. Any questions for Devin? All right. So Jill is next. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank. Um, so I also um, only have a few things to add. I, uh, I think Helen and uh, Todd did a great job of outlining the concerns. Um, just to put a little bit of a fine point on it from the home health perspective, our patients obviously can't drive around to go to hotspots. So the only way we can take care of them is at home. And, um, and we have been doing that. So for home health, uh, a lot of what we've done is uh, what we are calling blended episodes, where we might provide some care to an individual in person because it's really necessary. There's no other way to provide lots of types of care. But to the extent that there are follow-up visits or check-ins that we can do remotely, we're doing those remotely. And so that's really how it's worked um, for telehealth for home health. We were pretty well set up for it in the sense that all of our nurses already have uh, and therapists have their own laptops or, or um, iPads. Um, that's actually different than many physician practices. Uh, we were already ready for that piece of it. Um, in terms of the reimbursement, just to get to Senator Pearson's question, um, Medicare actually strongly penalizes us for doing those blended episodes. Uh, unlike most provider types, they have not figured out a way to pay us. Um, so that remains a, a ongoing federal frustration, Vermont has done a nice job of uh, working it out for us. So there's really nothing we can do here in Vermont um, about that, but wanted the committee to know that. I'm glad my internet is holding up. We're at 5-1 here in Middlesex, Vermont on a regular basis. So <laughs> I always would do my like, audio Would separate. you like 20, I have mentioned uh, your, that you would probably relish 25-3. <laughs> 
25-3 would change our lives. The fortnight around here would be unbelievable. <laughs> the irony of this is I'm broadcasting from Charleston, Vermont today in the, up in the MEK, and I have 25-3 here, so. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. Jill, Jill's up the road from the state house. Yep. <laughs> three, three and a half miles from the state house. So. If, yeah. I think, yeah. I think that's, I think that's all, all my comments. I don't, I don't want to belabor the point. I think we've, yeah, we're all pretty much on the same page. Okay. Any questions for Jill? Okay. Laura. Pelosi. Good afternoon. Thank you. I'm here today for the Vermont Healthcare Association, which represents the long-term care facilities, nursing homes, residential care homes, and assisted living residences. And I'm broadcasting from Waterbury Center, where I just got an upgrade to 7-3. <laughs> so I drop in and out. What are you, 10 time. miles from the state house? Yeah, just about. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, it's been really important for um, long-term care facilities to have access to telehealth services for their residents in this COVID environment. Um, just to kind of set the playing field for the committee members, the way it typically works is if you're a nursing home resident or you live in a residential care home or an assisted living and you have to have an appointment with your primary care physician or a specialist, for the most part, you are leaving your long-term care facility and going to that physician or specialist's office. Um, in this world of COVID, what we know is that our long-term care facilities are probably the most susceptible to entry of this virus and anything that we can do to minimize the amount of exposures that our residents have by having to leave the building to obtain medical and healthcare services is really important. So we know that there are facilities out there who do not have good internet access, who've tried really hard in this COVID environment to do a lot more telehealth and that's been really challenging. Um, based on the information I have right now, it's pretty clear that our nursing home in uh, Northfield, uh, Barton, Glover, we've got residential care homes in Derby Line. None of them have um, very good access to internet at this point in time. Our nursing facility in Greensboro, apparently there's fiber that is um, uh, available on the main street, but it's a relatively expensive connection for them to try to tap into that service. And we're talking about providers who rely very heavily on Medicaid, 60 to 70 percent of their utilization is is Medicaid. Um, we've also heard of some issues in Bennington County and Rutland County um, as well. So we've got 170 long-term care facilities that span the state. Uh, so any help that you could provide in helping them uh, increase and improve their access would greatly benefit the residents of those facilities. Okay. Other questions? And the Northfield facility is within 10 miles of the state capitol. Yes. All right. Is Any it in the question? village of Northfield? Uh, Mayo Healthcare. Yeah, right, yeah. right, right behind the uh, Norwich football field. Yes. Yeah. 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 I don't. I think they merged the village and the town, Senator, a couple of years ago. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, but it's practically downtown, right? Yes. Right. It's practically on the university on the university campus. Yeah. Any kind of telephone. There was no cell service in Northfield. I think they have limited cell service now. One one provider. Um, I've had to drive to the town offices to get the water turned on in a house downtown. You just don't. It's I think Chelsea is a similar dark hole. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. We have residential care homes in Chelsea. We didn't hear back from everybody, but it would surprise me for them as well. But I think it's it's a it's an issue of slow and spotty speeds, and they drop a lot of um, telehealth, you know, um, appointments. So in the middle of an appointment, the service will drop off. We're hearing that from a lot of facilities, which is a lot more critical than if you drop off in the middle of a Senate hearing. So, <laughs> um, okay, any questions for Laura at this point. Julie, Tesla, welcome. Thank you. 
very much. I don't get to speak with this committee very often. Uh, so my name is Julie Tesler. I work for the uh, Vermont Care Partners, representing the designated and specialized service agencies in Vermont. Um, for us, telehealth has proved to be very effective. It's actually one of the silver linings of COVID-19 is that we've learned how effective it is. We went from using 100 units of the service in January to over 7,500 in April. Um, and we're finding some benefits. Uh, we have less no-shows than we used to have because uh, a lot of the people we serve have lower incomes and a lot of stresses on them. Um, so now they don't have the same barriers with transportation and childcare that used to interfere with access. Um, so our therapeutic groups actually have a higher attendance than they did pre-COVID. Um, we are using audio only for some clients um, and that's the best we can do for some folks that don't have access, but that's not gonna be allowable uh, probably by CMS when this disaster uh, period ends. So even if it's an interim solution, it's not a long-term solution. Um, I think other people have mentioned sure that it's, oh, sorry. Yeah, we have a question, Julie. Uh, just yeah. when, when, when the emergency ends, you will no longer be able to do telephone medicine or you will not get compensated for doing telephone medicine. That's what was the... Um, we won't be able to receive Medicaid or Medicare reimbursement for telephone only. Hope we will hopefully, we will continue to be able to get reimbursement for telehealth um, using audio visual. It's, it's the telephone only, which particularly for elders, not all of them um, have the equipment and have been um, using this, but we're also, one of the things we're doing during COVID is getting people laptops and computers so that we can communicate with them. People who haven't used them before or had access to them before. We've gotten some grant funds and scrounged up some money so that we're getting more of that equipment out there so we can use telehealth and the audio visual, which is superior. Um, than telephone. Yes, it yes. is. Well, Absolutely. It just, that's Obviously. for some people, telephone's the only way. So we actually have staff who are using track phones and they can't, uh, because not, our staff also live in rural areas and don't always have access to broadband. So we have this image of them, like, you know, they're working out of their cars now, but that's not going to work as the weather gets colder. Okay. So, uh, um, are, are, the, are the people thank, who work thank for you, us? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, 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 I'm trying to measure, think as we talk about how building less expensive broadband to people's homes is an economic disincentive for the long term of getting high resolution um, business quality broadband. And th th there's a tension here and I'm, I'm trying there to understand the, okay. the parts. I can't yeah. address that, it's above my head. I just know the basic would be really helpful for the, the work that we do and the people we serve one of the groups in particular are the students that use our therapeutic schools. They tend to come from lower income families and have less access um, and live in rural areas. So our ability to provide education to them because they're coming to us for schooling full time um, is really being impacted as well. So we're hoping that in the future they'll have access. Um, so that's all the information I have to add. And I do very much appreciate your committee taking this up and um, Senator McDonald's, you've asked some, a question I can't answer um, and um, I leave it to your committee to deliberate, you know, what are the cost benefits and how you wanna make investments. Thank you. Okay, committee, any questions at this point? Okay, for the representatives out there, if you could help us, I mean, I think we already found out in health and welfare, there's CFR money out there for, you know, the purchase of equipment. There's even money out there apart from this pandemic for telemedicine and equipment. But we're talking maybe poles and wires, maybe wireless. But, and it might be doable um, in a town like Northfield, which 
has schools and a nursing home and a veterans home and there are vet there's veterans money. Um, those might be more doable uh, if you can, you know, just if you can any information at this point that helps us get some small um, achievable in a very few months so we can't string very much wire, um, but maybe up, you know, a mile up the road if that's all it's going to take. Um, and we'll have the hassle about what speed we're going to hold out for and the cost of holding out for it and the future cost of not holding out. Yeah, but, that's the, that's yeah, the balance. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, uh, but any, anything you can do to help us, because I think in the next few weeks, um, we're going to have to come up with a proposal if there's going to be one for using the CFR money for broadband. So um, just if, when you're talking to your folks, see if, you know, if one of them knows, oh yeah, you know, something hollow road doesn't have anything and we've got three folks up there um, that could really use telemedicine. And if you got a couple kids in between then or in the same house, then we're that just gets us a better argument. Okay. Thank you. I am We'll see you all probably in the morning. Yeah. Um, I am looking and I don't, yes, Charles Martin is here. We're a few minutes ahead, but Charles is from the Chamber of Commerce and, right, um, from the Vermont Chamber and has been asking um, to talk to us. I think he and I have been playing phone and email tag for a while and just wanted to talk to us about some things that are on the chamber's mind as we work our way through. So this was when we could get everybody fit in. So Charles, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Charles Martin from the Vermont Chamber of Commerce. Um, I wanted to take the time to kind of briefly meet with the committee to express um, what my members are conveying to me and kind of what I've heard uh, from meeting with just about everyone who has an opinion on broadband in the state, both public and private. Um, since this whole uh, pandemic kicked off, uh, the Vermont Chamber has sort of been doing a lot of thinking about the future of Vermont. Um, and we believe that the state is well positioned to become a work from home capital, um, certainly in the country. Um, and we essential to realizing this goal. Sorry, is, is Charlie, I, would you repeat that? Would you repeat that? Vermont will become what? Of a the work country? from home capital. A work from home. Yes, thank you very much. Um, we're already noticing, and Mike, just speaking with realtors um, and sort of our own internal knowledge, uh, we're already noticing people who are looking to or have relocated here uh, because obviously the state of Vermont has done a lot better in the midst of the pandemic than a lot of other urban areas. Um, so central to achieving that goal is high speed internet. Uh, most couples moving from an urban area don't want anything to do with a township that doesn't provide them with uh, equitable internet access. So that's kind of where we started off um, when we were looking at this problem. Um, I've been following the DPS emergency broadband action plan conversation to an extent and met with the department as well. And we definitely applaud long-term thinking um, in the legislature um, related to robust internet access that exceeds federal standards and we support you know, any effort to ensure public funds are invested in a very lasting way. Um, but that said, we're also cognizant of the reality facing unserved workers who cannot telecommute, children who are unable to telelearn, and patients who, like you just heard, are unable to access providers. I would point out to the committee, and I think it's important to understand that these tasks are almost always sufficiently covered through access to federally defined broadband. Um, it's worth mentioning uh, because I know that's a really big part of this conversation. So kind of on that note, uh, we encourage the legislature to view broadband access as it relates to COVID-19 and the pandemic in two separate parts. There's sort of an emergency relief portion 
Um, and that's bringing access to those students who have nothing and those workers who have nothing um, and those patients who don't have the ability to access their providers um, as quickly as possible with whatever it takes to get them that basic, basic uh, equipment or basic function. Then there's that second part that the legislature has highlighted in its kind of internal goals to provide uh, what I've heard called future-proof um, access that will potentially or theoretically be a little lasting and serve Vermonters um, into the future. So that'd be kind of the first, the first part of the conversation that I've seen muddied a little um, when I've seen the public or engaged the public on this. I don't think there's um, as much of an understanding that really what's being discussed uh, is an emergency relief proposal and then separate of that there's an economic long-term economic infrastructure investment conversation um, at hand. So in the interest as I mentioned earlier of object, uh, approaching this conversation with as objective a mindset as I could I, I met with uh, virtually everyone with a position of influence on the broadband question the state public and private DUDs schools uh, state agencies and of course the private sector um, I've also been engaging our membership internally in the greater business community. Um, in the majority of those engagements, people have expressed support for an immediate injection of funding to provide emergency broadband build out now. And one of the reasons I, I kind of emphasize the now and how this ties into long term economic planning is people are looking for homes in Vermont right now. And as everyone on the committee has probably heard someone from the chamber say one or two times, we're trying, we have been trying to recruit population to the state for a very long time. And if our neighbors to the east and west, um, you know, have, or the rural counties in New York or um, places in New Hampshire have broadband access and town X in Vermont does not, very oftentimes it doesn't take too many conversations with realtors to know that, that a couple who's looking for a house or an individual looking for a house will, will go for the town in the state or the county that has the uh, broadband access. Um, and I wanted on the kind of 100 over 100, 25 over 3 conversation, I wanted to kind of provide an anecdote of my own situation. My brother um, and his girlfriend lived with us for about three months. Uh, they moved in from Philadelphia. Uh, my brother's girlfriend's an architect. He's a graphic designer. My wife works for a very well-known uh, health provider in the state uh, doing web design. And I have been more or less running an economic crisis resource center for the last three months from my kitchen table. My speeds, and I'm not... I'm not happy about this, um, but I also just want to point it out in terms of like kind of highlighting the technology necessary to achieve the emergency relief. My speeds average six over three. So that's what I'm doing at my house right now. And we are not having any sort of technical delays. I mean, there's the occasional loading bar, but we are able to all have our lives intact and we're all able to make, earn a living um, and access who we need to access remotely with six over three as a speed. And that's running four computers, four phones and two iPads simultaneously. So I, I, I really just want to point that out to kind of highlight when we have conversations about 100 over 100, that is, and that is a really great goal, um, but it's also sort of what's necessary for world championship online game, gaming or sort of projecting a hologram in your kitchen at this point. Um, Zoom, for instance, um, and it's when it has its user advisory that you look at before you buy the product, uh, it advises at least speeds of 1.5 over 1.5. Netflix advertises a need for speeds at three megabits per second. And YouTube uh, tells their users that you need between one and 2.5 megabits per second. Um, so I really only say that to point out that people can have, it, people can be provided um, federally defined broadband at 25 over three and meet those basic sort of human needs of telehealth, telelearn um, access. <clears throat> um, you know, and I've, I've heard people are getting kind of creative and it's somewhat disturbing in the way that they are becoming creative. I mean, it's, it's heartwarming, but upsetting. I, I've spoken to a few principals at this point um, in Orange County where I grew up. And one of those uh, educators expressed that they had used money out of their own school's budget to pay for broadband build out to the entirety of their special education population because they have no resources coming in and no one was actually serving that, those households who are also low income households and rural areas in Orange County. Um, and I, I kind of only say that because, you know, that's great that they were able to do that, but that's not necessarily the best use of their, their school budget. Um, it's, it's, they probably want to use their budget on other things. 
But when they do serve those those households, they don't they not only serve the students, they serve the parents who might need to telework, and they also serve the whole family who now has access to telehealth capabilities. So it really is, it really does kind of serve all th the trifecta of need um, when you can actually do that additional build out with just a relatively small cash injection that provides service off the pole to the household. Um, so more or less, I just wanted to convey that sort of sense of urgency that I'm hearing on a uh, daily basis on this. And I apologize if this is redundant because I know the community, the committee has already heard a lot of this to begin with, uh, but I felt it was necessary to sort of bring that forward on behalf of my members and the people in my orbit. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions anyone might have. And make sure you tell your principal that buying that uh, broadband for students out of his budget is probably yeah. reimbursable. I, I will. With with COVID, I'm assuming the Department of Ed will be reaching out to, because I don't think he's alone in. Yeah. In, um, so, uh, done. Okay, I've got Senator McDonald. Just, I want to compliment the witness on thought, a thoughtful trying to figure things out and, and compare the choices. And um, I don't, anyway. That's, we don't always get that. So I want to thank the witness. Appreciate that, Senator. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Um, and if you, well, again, it, it gets difficult, but anything, because whatever we do with this batch of COVID money has to be up and running by December 31st. Mm -hmm. So if you can find us someplace, uh, an industrial park, a startup, um, you know, sharing group, anything like that that could use the help, let us know. Um, if it's because we're, we're really going to be under the gun here trying to get things out. So um, thank you. No, I appreciate that. And I'd, I'd also say I let Faith, uh, I sent Faith a copy of the public comment we provided on the DPS emergency plan. And I have a little, there's a little more detail. Uh, on that. Okay. So. so I may have gotten that and missed it in my email, but if not, Faith, if you can resend it to all of us. It's um, actually online. Would you like it also sent to you? I will leave that up to the committee. Is it online for today? Yes, it is. Okay. I can find it then. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Charles. Um, I think that's it for the day. Tomorrow we have a much lighter load. Um, we're going to continue the education property tax and miscellaneous tax discussion. And, um, I don't know if we still have Adam Gresham on or not tomorrow. You do uh, not. We do not. That's what I thought um, because he left it to Secretary French to explain what the current thinking is on how they're gonna fund Ed this year. So I must say it's Interesting, usually we're having a fight over three cent raise in the property tax. And this year it's like, oh, is that all? <laughs> it's that's, your two, that's your two cent worth of it. <laughs> yeah, it's now 17 cents. <laughs> uh, but we're going to keep working on that. And at this point, I think that, and I think I just sent something over to Faith to have on for Thursday, but um, maybe we can get them in on Wednesday. So it looks like you might get Thursday and Friday off. Friday, we may be on if that's when we can get the broadband consultants to talk to us. We are going to be meeting on Thursday. We I are going to be meeting on. on Thursday. Okay. Correct. Right. We are. All right. Senator Campion, do you have a question? Uh, no, I was just wondering about the, the meeting on Thursday. Is that the joint meeting that we were going to do last week with um, House Technology? No. no, it's the discussion of the bills today, H674, S200, and S310. Oh, okay. Thank you. That's right. The little current use bills. I knew I'd 
told Faith to put something on for Thursday. So uh, we'll try and get those out. For those that weren't here at the beginning, I have noted that our TIF bill is sitting waiting for third reading. So I'm going to ask if I can get that released. It completely slipped my mind because I know I presented it on the floor and then I just kind of lose track of things. But it never went through third reading. Why was um, that? Do you know, Madam Chair? We went home. Oh. I, I, I think oh, I presented it since... like on Thursday. <laughs> wow. And we went home. So um, it's just been sitting there. It's mostly clarifications. I don't think there's anything particularly controversial on that one. Mm -hmm. So if we could get it, it in case any downtown feels vigorous enough or for those that are in the process of a TIF, um, it will clarify some of the issues that came up in St. Albans. So um, I'm gonna try and get that one out. Anything anybody else would like to take up, let me know.